What's up, everybody? We are back here for part two of this special episode with my good friend Josh Hicks. And this is the Level Up Your Life podcast. You already know me. Your host is always Billy Anderson. It's funny because this is my first time ever doing an intro that wasn't exactly the same. But this is also our first time, I think, doing a part two. Part so two, man. We're, 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 we're breaking the mold here and, and going with part two. But we got into so much good stuff on that first part, uh, first episode that we wanted to break it just so that we could make it not so difficult to digest. We wanted to be able to make it a little bit more palatable for everybody because at the end of the day, this is about bringing value to you as our community. And so let's jump back into it. Josh, while we took a quick break here, Josh had a topic he wanted to get back into. So I'm going to let him lead this because he's technically my co-host on this episode, I guess. <laughs> I think we should just start a new podcast. Just start a new podcast. The, yeah, the yeah, J-Man yeah. and Billy episode <laughs> uh, the podcast. It's, it's, it, I was going to say something else, which would have been terrible. Yeah, but anyway. I'm going to go Belvedere Bill. <laughs> no, I wasn't going to say Belvedere Bill. I was oh, going to say something else. <laughs> yeah, let's, let's not go there because Belvedere Bill is already bad enough. <laughs> Oh, man, dude. Okay. Well, let's get serious. All right. Let's get into that second half. So we left off kind of talking about tenacity and perseverance and being relentless. Are you willing to put in the work to do what it takes to be successful, no matter all the trials you might face, right? And one thing I've noticed a ton, it's and I think right now it's a cultural thing in the times that we live in, how fast information travels, right? Social media, internet, you know, in everything just encompassing, I'm seeing as I consult a lot of startup founders and first time business owners, a lot of people are looking for rapid instantaneous growth in any single thing that they do. And from a VC startup standpoint of things, right? Looking at uh, startup founders that have never been startup founders before, they say, we're gonna do $5 million our first year in revenue right? Or small business owners, not necessarily a startup, you know, but people that have a cool idea for a product or service and they want to start their small business. They say, all right, our first year, we want to do this amount of, this amount of revenue. And I think it's just a cultural thing we live in right now that the idea of growth, better yet manageable growth is just gone. No. Completely. A hundred percent. And the reason why growing at the right pace is just it's beyond, it's fundamental, yeah. right? Is, you know, I, I, you and I have talked about this just privately on the phone, but your first 100K in sales, that's hard. If you've never started a business before, you've never been an entrepreneur, you've never had a startup, just anything, grinding it out, your first 100K in sales, we were up till, we talked about this the other day, we used to be up till two in the morning working. Yeah to get that first that first 100k in sales in what was PFS meals yep. at the time. And the reason why it's just so vitally important to go through now let's call it what it is. It's hard and it and it kind of sucks, right? But the reason why the that that first initial growth or that first 100k in sales is just fundamental. Everything you're going to learn about running a business, that first 100k in sales, you're laying the foundation that will allow you to do so much greater things with your business, no matter how big or, or you, can, you can scale it. And I just don't feel like people nowadays in our culture, and again, I think it's a cultural thing. That's like, at least from my perspective, I feel like it's out the window, man. Yeah, it's, it's funny because I think that people look at like 100% growth year over year is so freaking challenging. And people look at it as like, I, if I, like they're, they're, they do 20,000 in a month and they're like, I'm going to do $10 million next year and, or this year. And you're like, I, I, like, they don't have investment. They don't have the resources. The staff. This, I mean, but, the, like, staff, but the resources yeah. and the money are what is going to allow you to get the staff to be able to do that. Like, like, can you quantify what it takes to get from X amount to X amount? Because like, you know, when we have clients that will reach out to us and they'll say things like, all right, we're doing a million a year. We want to get to 10 million next year. And then they're like, we want to do X, Y, and Z on, on social and X, Y, and Z on paid. And then I'm like, cool, it's going to cost this. And they're like, yeah, our budget's like $2,000. And you're like, but you want to get this. Like they want, they want a billion dollar result, but they want to invest, you know, $1,000. And, and it's so unfortunate because the, our expectations of what it takes to grow is wildly disconnected from the reality. 
and and there's this this like I want, and then the reality, and then there's there's no connection between them. And I think what's worse about this, and, and you might take this another way, but like what's worse about this is that when you continuously set these types of expectations on yourself, people people might think that it doesn't matter if I don't hit my goal, but I, I'm telling you subconsciously it fucks with you horribly. Taking those types of losses. When you say, I'm going to do 100,000 this year and you do 15,000, that massive difference is just so deflating to your ego, to your, your own confidence. And that if you continuously lose like this and set these crazy expectations and lose, crazy expectations and lose, crazy expectations and lose, you start to doubt yourself. Yeah. And, and I think that's where... The, the level of confidence you have at 21 versus the level of confidence you have at 41 is completely different from the average person. Because when you're 21, you're just young, dumb, and stupid, and you're like, I can do anything. And then you start trying to do this insane growth, and then you start getting smacked down, and you're like, well, maybe I'm good with like $20,000. Maybe I'm good with, maybe I should just not even be an entrepreneur. And, and I think people don't understand that the consequence to setting these unrealistic expectations and then not hitting is actually demoralizing and, and detrimental to growing to where you should be getting to, if that makes sense. No, it, it totally does. And because they, they see what everyone, a, a lot of people, and again, I, and I see this because of how I'll help startup founders or first-time business owners, is they, they see how a lot of other people are doing things out there, right? So they don't see the... What's what's the word I'm looking for? The the pretext to what led them to get to where they are, right? They see the the, the end goal. They don't see. They the, see the end goal. They, they don't see. Z, they, they don't see, see the start. You know? Precisely, and you know, with a lot of people that want to do insane amounts of revenue, a lot of people have a misunderstanding of the definition of manageable growth. They think manageable growth is okay. This year I'm going to do fifty thousand. Next year I'm going to do seventy five. Next year, I'm going to do 100. And that's not what manageable growth. Manageable growth simply means you grow at a rate that you can literally handle and you have the support support to be able to do so, right? If you did $100,000 this year and you have the right foundation, the right systems, the right processes, the right staff to do 500000 next year, you can yep. and you will. But you can't have that growth unless you have the right foundation and the right support to do so. And... You said it so perfectly, it can be deflating to a lot of people because going back to, and the reason I wanted to bring this up is gonna, it ties into a lot of people nowadays, their definition of entrepreneurship is based on what they see, not what it actually is. You know, building something and putting your name on something is a whole different journey than people expect it to actually be, right? And being, you're stepping into the world of business and entrepreneurship is the reality is we were just talking about this off camera is it's not meant for everyone and that's okay yeah. and that is and that is like a totally okay perfect thing because you can be drastically successful as an individual that's not an entrepreneur you can make an absolute killing live an amazing life that's very very financially successful friends that that are never own their own business and they get their weekends off <laughs> and, they work at a great company. and they go home when yeah. they go home they don't take work home they don't take Mentally work home or physically <laughs> exactly and it's one of those things venturing into the world of, of entrepreneurship it's the greatest risk but it also has the greatest reward mm -hmm. you know and if you're someone that's willing to do that i'm an individual that loves talking about how can we grow this in a way that is going to be successful for you and i just can't tell you man how many times like even when i was actually working in vc how many times we would meet with startup founders and they're like yeah we're going to do this insane revenue it's like okay well how are you going to do that right you can scale yourself to failure, right? If you do $10 million, that's great. How are you gonna deliver your $10 million in sales? You can get the sales, but it doesn't mean you can support them. Well, I remember when I, uh, I my first time getting an investor into, into GoFresh, um, I had, uh, well, right before this, I had just entered, um, I don't know if you know, Jason Calacanis. Um, he's uh, got Angel List, that's his, his, one of his syndicates that he runs. He runs probably one of my favorite podcasts um, called This Week in Startups. And then he's also a part of, um, I'm not blanking on it. He's on another podcast with Chamath, David Sachs, and um, David, um, oh, why am I blanking on this? Anyways, Chamath, super, I mean, they're all, Chamath kind of made SPACs more yeah, famous yeah. more recently. But anyways, so he had a, uh, this, or he had um, uh, 
what was it called? Launch? Launch was his event in San Francisco, and he had this opportunity to um, be able to pitch your, 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 your business, right? So I just went through this. I, I started to think of GoFresh as a tech, food, or food tech business, right? And I went to our first investment. We didn't get selected. We made it to the final round. We did a virtual pitch, and they did not take us, right? So fine, no big deal. Probably the best thing that ever happened that I did not go that because I would have gotten just kicked in the face. <laughs> um, and so anyways, so I went shortly thereafter. Um, we, were, we had a round of investment, right? So go to meet with this particular investor. And I'm like, I, I tell him the number. And he's like, cool. Like, do you think this is a fair evaluation? And I was like, well, if I put tech before my name, I could get X. And he's like, are you willing to take on what it means to have tech before the word food? Because he's like, just adding that word does not mean that your company is now worth more. It means that you have to now do more and take on more risk. Are you willing to do that? And I was like, Whoa. like it was a mind blowing thing. Like sometimes people look and like, well, I could do this. I could go to a venture capital. Like, or, or I'm going to go to a venture capital. Like I just shared that story of a friend that wanted to get access. And it's like, but do you understand now that level of responsibility from going your friends and family to now going to a VC or to a legitimate you know, syndicate or whatever, of any fund, right? There is a different level of now risk and responsibility that you have. Are you willing to do that? Most people cannot handle VC. Uh, but not even, but in, in, and I'm saying this from not necessarily just the BC standpoint. Most people won't even get through the vetting process, the due diligence process. They'll be like, bro, I want my money in like 30 days. <laughs> Tell them I gotta wait three years for it. No. Yeah. But more importantly, like growth comes with risk and responsibility. Totally. And, you know, I learned this the hard way with GoFresh. It's like when you're scaling locate, like especially brick and mortar, it's like you're scaling overhead, you're scaling. You're scaling your systems. Do you have a system that can scale? Do you have a model that can scale? Do you have the, the, the staff? Do you have the, there's so much that goes into growth that it's not just this thing that's like, I make more money now. But like, are you the person that's willing to go to battle that we just talked about right before we hit record? Yeah. Are you willing to give up nights with your family? Are you willing to give up nights for yourself? Are you willing to not go out on the weekends? Gary Vee talks about this all the time. Are you willing to eat shit for your 20s and 30s to have what you want in your 40s and 50s. Like, are you willing to? Or do you just want the vanity or the, the thought of, oh, once I get there, I'm going to have all this money and time and freedom. Like, Can I comment on that real yeah, quick? Yeah, go ahead, please. That was my final comment. When you're, when you, when you're building a, a, a startup or a business, whatever it is, I know you can relate to this 100%. Other, whoever listens to this is going to find this funny. You get real creative with your meals when you ain't got nothing in the fridge. <laughs> I didn't have to get that creative with GoFresh because we sold food, so it was real easy. But like, but everything else. Yeah. The only clothes you yeah. wear are your company clothes. Are your work company like clothes. Like whatever, yeah, whatever yeah. branded. I only bought more branded shirts because I needed some more clothes. You know, it's like you you are you get creative with life. Like it, growth is not an easy thing. Like it is very very challenging, and it is you you have to be willing to risk it all. To grow your business. They Gr growing your business feeds into what I was, Brian and I were just having this conversation. Growing your business falls into what I believe to be the true definition of what love is. Yeah. I just told you this. <laughs> love is what you do despite of what you feel. And you cannot be an owner of any business or entrepreneur if you're not willing to take the risk based on how you feel, right? So when you look at, now I'm not trying to say running a business is the same as the definition of love, right? But when you look at the, the definition yeah. of love, love is what you do despite of what you feel. Are you willing to go through those times of eating nothing or not having clothes or whatever the sacrifices might be? Are you willing to go through that for your why of why you're starting your business? 100%. Right. So if you decide to venture down this road of entrepreneurship, why? Why? I mean, yeah. you already know. We don't even have to talk about this. Your why. Yeah. Right. What is your reasoning for wanting to do this? And, and you know, I think that's that's a great point. I was going to say this earlier when you were talking about something. And I, I think the one of the biggest things is your why. If you don't like, and I think people are like, oh, I want, I want to like end generational, you know, poverty. Like, I want to, I like, okay, and I respect the shit out of that, but like, like, are, 
have you fixed your wealth issue? Because like, you know, like I, I think sometimes people just like, they put these like really crazy whys and they're like, I want this, what? But it's like, forget all that. Like, let's get real detailed. Like what, what is it really? Because I think people put these like, kind of like, like there's these crazy blown out goals out there because they're like, I know I'm not going to get it, but like, like I'm just going to throw it up there. Like I want to be a billionaire. Like, okay, cool. Like, but like, let's get down to like what it really means. Like not money, not freedom, but like, what is freedom? Like if you had freedom, what, what does freedom mean? If you had money, what does money mean? What does it give you the access to? Because those are just tools. Like, bro, let me tell you, if I had a little time, Right now, I'm gonna sit on my couch and just like take a day off and just be like, <laughs> sleep a little bit, right? But that's not my why. So yeah. for me to say, oh, I need, I want more time. I want time freedom. Well, what are you gonna do with time? What are you gonna do? Like time, time is just a concept. Money is just a concept, but like what is or a tool? What are you gonna do with it? Is it about creating memories with your family? Is it being able to take them on vacations? Is it being able, like let's get down to the whys? And I like to always say like clarity brings confidence. And the reason that most people aren't com actually confident in their daily actions. And why they allow their emotion or how they feel to dictate the, what they do, it's because they aren't actually clear on what they want. And when people ask me, why do I, why do I wake up? Why do I have this energy? Why do I work so hard? Why do I have this drive? It's because I, I know what I fucking want in life. Yeah. And I'm willing to go through a gosh damn brick wall to get to that. And it's a powerful thing. But like, if thing. you don't have that, most people, it, like I, I was about to knock this cup off the, the table, but I was like, that's going to cause a mess. But like most people can just easily, like the wind will blow and they're like, Whoosh. like I'm out of here. I was like, you like, should have done it. That's authentic, bro. Was that? Do it. No, but, well, <laughs> this is a different podcast. There you go. That's what will happen when most people face challenges. They'll be knocked the fuck off. And then it takes them a month to get back on track. And growth, what comes with growth? A fuck ton of challenges. More challenges than they are non challenges. Right, and, and you and I obviously have many of stories, whether it be working together or, or just conversations. Growth is challenging, and it will test you over and over and over. But you know, to get the testimony, you have to have the, the you know have to have the test, right? And so many people are unwilling to be tested, and I think more often than not, it's that they they lack the clarity to understand that there are going to be tests, and more importantly, why they're taking those tests. And if you don't understand though, if you don't understand that there's going to be challenges in growth, then you're mentally not prepared for them. Like I can quantify a, a challenge now and be like, shit, we're that much closer. Because if I'm not going through this type of stuff, then I'm not actually growing. Like I love when people complain to me about like, bro, I'm like dealing with this, I'm dealing with that. I'm like, good man, that means you're growing. Because if none of those things were happening, not growing. Brian, you want to know why when we pray and we ask God for things, we don't get it instantaneously? Because a blessing given too soon is not a blessing at all. That's so it. when we were 21, right? 20, 22, 23, whatever it is, right? And we say, this is what we want. There's a reason why our first car is not a supercar. Because if our very first car, when we asked for it, was a supercar, one of two things would happen. We would hurt ourselves or we would hurt someone else, Right? So in order for us to get what we asked for, we have to go through times that will basically enable us that when we can handle it, we'll receive it. Look, you see, man, you guys can't see this in the camera, but that, that's it right there. Yeah. So and when we really say, it? so when we say, right, I want or just to comment what you said, I want to be a billionaire. It's like, okay, no. you are going to get tested in that. Can you do... Can, if you can't handle 100000 you can't handle being a billionaire, yeah. right? So when we pray and we ask God forgive us to things or we ask our mentors to help us achieve things, right? Like we're talking about connections, yeah. right? If you have a connection to someone, say, that's of a high level, can you handle that connection, right? Or if you say, I want to do this with my business, this is my why, this is what I want to do, can you handle it? Because if you immediately get what it is you ask for, you're not going to be able to appreciate it and you're not going to be able to use it properly. So what does it mean to be an to step in the world of entrepreneurship when you look at your why, that why is going to be tested. Because if you just immediately got your why, it's going to go down the drain. So a blessing given too soon is not a blessing at all because you'll destroy your blessing and then, yeah, I mean, your life is just going to forever change.
I love that, man. And I, you know, I think that con the, 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 what you're saying is, is a great way to look at it. And I, you know, I think that it's, it's like you, all those challenges, all those tests are only preparing you for who you need to become. And if you are choosing to exit that path because of the challenges, then you were never meant to have You're that. never meant to have that. And, and that's the way it is. Like I, it is a, a very hard reality, but that is, that is the reality of, of, of life relationship, business, life. Like if you're not willing to do or become the person that you need to be, then you'll never be it. Like how many parents have said, look, you'll never be ready to have a kid. Like, because like, I'm, you know, I've obviously had this conversation with my family. And they're like, you're ne never going to be ready. You just like, just do it, dude. You just do and it. And then you become the person. Literally. And that's what my brother-in-law has yeah. talked to me about time and time again. It's like, you become the person. Like you, like going back to amateur versus professional. Very same way of looking at having kids or not having kids. Like, oh, I, I've got to be a better parent. Ryan could probably speak to this best out of the two knuckleheads that don't have kids. But like, you became a dad once the kid was already born, like he wasn't like, all right, I'm going to do all these things. Cause you don't know what it's like to wake up in the middle of the night, to have to change diapers, have to do all this. You might have a concept from niece and nephews or friends, you kids, can't prepare for but something there's like nothing that. other than having the kid there and be like, this is my fucking seed. You know what I mean? Like I got to take care of this kid, you know, <laughs> yeah, like, dude. like, it, and it, and I think that's the reality is like from the very first thing you talked about in the beginning of the episode number one or part one, which is like, you know, like we have to become the person. And that's it. It's like we, the only way we'll do that is through trial and error. And the amateurs are the ones that want to be want to be perfect. But the professionals are the ones that understand trial and error is how you become a professional. I've I've heard I've heard a saying before. Now this wasn't even recent. This is a while ago. And I did my utmost best to try and find where did I see this or read it or hear it, whatever it is. Right. I did everything I could to try and find it, but I couldn't. But I remember what this saying was. To be a true master at anything means to be an eternal student. Yo. That's what it means. Who is it? So even the best of the best of the best of the best of the best in any, in any sport, in any profession, in any craft, whatever it is, they're constantly practicing, constantly learning. They're constantly doing the thing, especially in the world, in the world of business because, because markets change. Yes. Right? Markets change. Products change. Customers change, literally, we know that, right? Customers change all the time. So you always have to be willing to pivot and adapt based on how things currently are. And, and things have expedited in the process of changing more so than ever before. And I mean, look at, we yeah. just went from yeah. brick and mortar being the predominant retailer. That was the way. To yeah. then all of a sudden us going, brick and mortar's dead. It's all e-com. To now us watching Shopify and all these other e-commerce platforms get fucking destroyed and it's shifting back because people are like, we can't pay the, the cost of delivery and everything else, right? Because of inflation and gas prices and everything else that's caused shipping to go through the fucking rough. So now it's like all of a sudden we're like ebbing back to brick and mortar actually being the, 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 the favorite place to, to purchase things. So it's this weird like, and the markets are changing. And, and the old version of brick and mortar is not the new version of brick and mortar, nor is the old version of e-com the new. You know, there's so much you're, No, you're, you're totally right. And you're like totally if right. you... And you know, I think this is something that I used to have a hard time with was like, oh, but I told everybody we we're gonna do this a year ago. And it's like, but I had to realize like, if I wanna die on that sword, okay, I'll die on that sword. But like, I wanna fucking win and I don't wanna die. So I gotta be willing to go, guys, I was, I was wildly wrong or actually things are changed, we're doing this now. And you need to be willing to, to, to adjust and pivot. And I've always liked to tell people like, in business you have to keep your head up and your eyes open because you never know when you're gonna need to move. And there's too many people like, put your head down and work. Bro, no. Like, you put your head down and work, you can't see that there's a wall coming right in front of you. But you also can't see that there's an opportunity right in front of you. And so maybe you just put your head down and you walk right past that opportunity. So you have to keep your eyes, your head up and your eyes open at all times in running a business. I want to speak on a topic of actually something you just said. And you said, you're saying, admitting, right? Or like, hey, I was wrong on that. So this, this is going to go even beyond entrepreneurship and business. This is just, this is turning into a live podcast, by the way. This is what this is turning cool. into. Level up your Oh, life. you're right. I apologize. Level, I apologize. Up your business. level up your life process. Well, okay. it's predominantly yeah, a business yeah. focused podcast. <laughs> you guys are basically sitting in on Josh's and my every, this is every a normal conversation. conversation. This so. is a normal conversation. Yeah. So in, admitting, admitting faults or, or basically saying that was my bad, right? Of what you just said a few moments ago is for, is admittance conf or confessing and being able to offer forgiveness is one of the hardest things people can do. 
because from a leadership role standpoint to saying, hey guys, this is what we're doing, this is what I feel the best decision is, and it backfires on you. Yeah. And, it fect, and, it affects, and it affects your company and your employees. Or let's just say the employees say, hey, we think this is really a good idea, we should do this, and you say, okay, you give them a chance, it completely backfires, right? No, no matter what scenario it is, one, being able to admit you're wrong in something is a very high level of maturity as an individual. And two, but you know what's even harder than that is forgiveness. Oh, yeah. Because here's the thing. When it comes to forgiveness, typically, now, there are a few rare circumstances out there that are different, right? But when it comes to offering forgiveness, it's one of the hardest things to do because you have to completely take ego and pride out of the situation. You literally have to take off your crown. You have to meet someone at eye level. And you have to forgive them and you have to say, and it's all good yeah. and move forward. Now, even after you forgive someone, there's a part two. Can you continue forward with the same relationship mm. afterwards? So now let's just take that and apply it to professional world connections, business, yeah. right? If like, let's say you invest in someone's company and it goes south. I mean, did with you, but you're still getting there. You go. <laughs> Cost about 300 bucks. <laughs> 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 or in any or any which way, right? Right. Um, let's keep it on the same topic. Or the referral. Yeah. Right, yeah. <laughs> or like the referral, right? Are you are you able to like? What is your character as an individual when something goes wrong in your life or someone wrongs you, whether it's on purpose or by accident, to have that level of maturity, you know, not just mentally but spiritually as well, to humble yourself, take off your crown, because at the end of the day people is people process product it's all about people yeah. right are you are you able to do that and this is something i've found and i man i would have no doubt you've met all kinds of people like this right just not in life but in general as well is that's just not a trait people have and i think even on a professional level if you are able to humble yourself in that type of way and literally get rid of pride and ego in your life it will even excel your entrepreneurship journey you know, I think that one of the things that's that's very interesting with that is that as entrepreneurs, we 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 love to blame our employees, right? Like that's it's, I don't even call it entrepreneurship, but like in business ownership, right? We're like, oh, my employee fucked me here. Seventy five meals left in the back. Yeah, <laughs> that one might have been him, but, no, I'm just <laughs> but no, no, you, you, I think the the power of responsibility is one that that's that's evolved for me, um, particularly you know, and I'll give a shout out to him, Andrew Benhannon. I uh, don't think you watch the podcast, but maybe somebody that watches the podcast knows Andrew. Been a longtime friend. Men, he was my upline in network marketing many moons ago. Um, but he sponsored me into this program called uh, Landmark. And I went to the forum, which is the, the first program they have. And the first night, it's a three-day program. First night, they were like, like, talked about the power of responsibility. And I was like, I don't need to go back. Like, this thing opened up my eyes to realizing that res taking responsibility is not about saying right or I'm right or I'm wrong. It's about saying, I am, I am going to take responsibility to fix this problem yeah. or fix this thing. And so in any capacity, whether it's relationships, business, life, whatever, health, it's not to say that like, okay, like my employee fucked up. I'm taking responsibility. It's not saying I fucked up, but it's saying, okay, I'm going to take responsibility for this because there's a part I probably played in not setting him up. Maybe I didn't communicate to him right. Maybe I didn't explain it correct. Maybe I, you know, I could have done X, Y, and Z. When you can take responsibility for things, you now take power. But when you're the victim, you're helpless. There's nothing you can do, right? And so same thing, it's like, and I don't want to get into like rape or all these other things, but like, you know, like when things happen to you and you could say, all right, what could I have done or what can I do about this? It's not to say that what could you have done to prevent yourself from getting raped, but like, what are you going to do Going to forward. no longer be the victim. Sure. Because taking responsibility for a situation does not mean that you were right or wrong. It's to say, I'm going to take ownership over this and change the future of this and to change how this happens to me or how I view this down the road. And I think that's such a powerful thing to do in, in running a business. You have to be willing to take responsibility and say, I'm, I'm owning this. Because when you take responsibility, you are empowered. And that happened, you know, you obviously know my past with my dad. 
But I had to do that with my dad. Like my, my dad was, you know, obviously significantly 40 something years older than me. He's my father, like, and we had a horrible relationship. But I was unwilling to budge and he was unwilling to budge and neither of us were wrong. And I had to realize that for me to repair this relationship that mattered to me, I had to take responsibility. Yeah. And it didn't have to say that I'm wrong and all the things that I didn't believe in that my dad was doing were right. It just had to say that I'm going to react differently than this. And I changed how I approached it. I changed how I responded to him. And ultimately, I took all the power from him before I was blaming him, which gave him all the power. And I took the power from him. And, and at that point, he was powerless over me and how I responded to how he acted. And it changed the whole dynamic of our relationship and actually gave us the room to have workability because I was willing to take my defense down. Even though he was still defensive, I took my defense down because I was actually in control and I was able to build that bridge back with our relationship. It became a very healthy, loving relationship and I was thankful for those final years of his life to have this incredible relationship. But it was taking ownership and saying, I'm taking responsibility for it. And I think there's distinctions between these words that we often don't have in our own vocabulary that impact us on being able to implement the, that, those, that verbiage into our life. And I think so many people think responsibility is saying, oh, I'm wrong. That's not, not, not wrong at all. It's always about corrective action, yeah. right? It's always about corrective action. And at any moment in life, whether it's, it's involved in something professional related or your personal life, you know, there, there's a huge difference in teaching versus criticizing. And one of the biggest, oh, dude, this like, this like grinds me to my core when I see people in any form of higher level than someone else, whether it's a parent to a child or the CEO of a business to an employee, is when an instance occurs and the person that's at that higher position looks at it at a moment of criticize, not teach. And to truly have what I'm obviously so passionate about servanthood is no matter what the situation or circumstance is, can you use that as a teachable moment for someone else? Whether it's, you know, a kid that got in a fight at school and as a parent, you chastise him for it, or can you teach him about it, right? Or if you have an em employee that, you know, by accident, whatever, spent $5,000. I'm just throwing something out there, right? Can you use that mistake to make that person better? And I solely believe, you know, with all my heart, that is one of the qualities that makes someone a phenomenal leader. And I don't mean leader just yeah. in business. I'm saying like, like as a father, you're a leader yeah. to your family, yes. right? If you're a CEO, you're a leader to those that, you know, work with you. And I say work with, not for, yeah. Right. Yeah. right? They say work with, not for. And when you have that ability to teach and not criticize every single aspect of your business, every single part of your family and your home, it's just going to result in people living better because of that servanthood quality of making other people better. And, oh man, I don't like when I see that, when I don't see that, man. Yeah. Now, of course, um, people grow into that role. Yes, very much so. You know, being, if for someone that's a first time business owner, they don't have the experience of handling employee mistakes. So they might have to lose a, a few employees, right? Through bad management in order to become good at management, right? And that's okay. But whenever it comes to any form of leadership role, whether you're a CEO of a Fortune 500 company, you're a CEO of a business with five employees, or you're a parent, being able to teach versus criticize is simply making other people better. And I think to piggyback on that exact statement where you're saying that they grow into it, I think the, the, ability, the way to be able to grow into it is being vulnerable and open with people. And being think, vulnerable is huge. I, I think it's so often that I can have a conversation with you and I can be open and transparent with you. Right. Like we, we have that type of relationship, but it starts with being open and honest with each other. I think there's so many people, especially in business, that they'll get on a call with me. I'll be like, so what's going on? Like, I want to pick your brain. Well, what about? Yeah, early, yeah. And they don't want to tell you like, yo, bro, I'm, I'm, I'm fucking hurting. I don't have money. Like my wife's going to leave me or any of this stuff. Like they won't be honest. Mm. And then they end up crashing and burning. And you're like, dude, like, why did you talk to me? Like, ah, oh, bro, I just couldn't tell you. And it's like, dude, like. It's an insecurity. If you're unwilling yeah. to be honest about your business, first of all, 
what have we talked about? Nothing but challenges and trouble. Like we've obviously had some, you know, some, some great successes, but we've talked a lot about the tough parts of business. If you won't listen to most business podcasts, what do they talk about? The tough things in business. The reality is, is business is tough. Life is tough. And if you're unwilling to open up with people that have been there and done that before, then you will never, more than likely, never get to that destination because you're running blind. You're trying to get somewhere that you've never been with no experience how to, to deal with the terrain, to deal with all this. Could you imagine being like an ultra marathon runner and hiring somebody <laughs> that's never ran before? Like, <laughs> like you're going to fucking fail, right? But like, who do you hire? You hire somebody that's run ultras before to teach you how to run an ultra because there is nothing else like running an ultra. I have no idea. I can only fathom. But from, yeah, I'm there I have with a couple you. friends you. that have yeah. run ultras and yeah. they'll tell me like, bro, shit's fucking wild. But you don't know that you pee yourself, poop yourself, cut your, rip your, lose your toes off or lose your toenails. Yeah. You know, get, like you don't know how to deal with this challenges if you haven't had somebody that's been there before. And I think that's one of the biggest misconceptions. And I think it's been amplified because of social media that people are unwilling to be open, to be vulnerable and to be a true leader. It's to be vulnerable. Because the only way for you to help other people to grow is for you, going back to what you said, to be that forever student. And that is the key characteristic of a great leader is leaders are students first. Yeah. There's only been one, there's only ever been one leader or king in this world that has not had to succumb from other leaders, bro. So what does that mean? That means every single person has to work with people better than themselves in order to grow and succeed and become better. And, and what you're saying is the only way to truly receive the benefit of, of support. Like if I, if you're my friend and I'm not open and honest with you, is our friendship true and like whole? No, it's not. Like you might be a hundred percent whole with me, but I'm like giving you 25%. It's two way street. Yes. And, and that, and that goes on the opposite side that if I'm being honest with you or I'm walking around with some shit in my teeth and you don't say something to me, like, are you really being my friend? Like, you know what I mean? Like, oh, ah, that's embarrassing. I, no, I, feel you, I feel you, dude. Like, yeah, yeah. bro, like, say something. I got some shit in my teeth. You know what's more embarrassing? Me having some stuff in my teeth and you not saying nothing. You're not it. saying anything. You yeah. know, and like... Your boy's not looking out for yeah, you. Yeah, you know, and I think that we're so afraid to be honest. But it's, it's funny because as I'm saying this, I realize there's like a dichotomy here, which is like, people are afraid to be vulnerable, but then people are also afraid to be honest with people. So like, we don't know how to have this like, fully two-way relationship. And I think this goes back to relationships. I think this is what destroys most relationships is a lack of willingness to be honest on both sides. Just listen to this great podcast from Brad Lee and I'm blanking on the other gentleman's name, but <laughs> he talked about it, that so many guys are unwilling to talk to their wives about what's bothering them. So it gets to this point that when guys are around each other, they're like, my wife's a bitch, my wife's this, my wife's that. And it's like, your wife's only that because you're holding all these resentments because you never communicated with her. She's actually not this big of a bitch, but because you were unwilling to talk to her and have a hard conversation, honest conversation, it's now this resentment level where you think she's a bitch and now you actually kind of don't like her. You're less attracted to her. The love is not there. Like all these things start falling apart when there is not communication. Why do most business relationships not last? Communication. Like I am a blunt, blunt business partner. I will be very honest with you. But I've had to learn that the way that I am blunt has to also change because my tonality can kind of come off like a dick. So I've had to learn that being direct is great because I want to be honest with you. But I also have to have it in a way that's palatable for you to be able to hear me and not hear me as like, damn, this guy's a fucking asshole. Yeah. Like I don't want to work with him anymore, right? And so it goes both ways, but it's about building that true line of communication, being authentic, whether it be coaching, whether it be friendships, whether it be relationships, business partnerships, any, any type of relationship comes with True and honest communication. Yeah. Well, I'm going to add something on top of that, right? Is I, I, I was taught this in my previous is that to make it, to make a relationship successful is communication and trust, yes. right? So when you look at communication and trust is what makes a relationship successful. Well, let's expand on that. What makes a successful business? As you just said, communication, and we'll add trust on top of that. Because when you have communication and trust, it's, it's essentially everything is always laid out on the table all the time. That allows for good ideas to happen. That allows for problems to be solved, right? In 
in anything else that succumbs to running a successful business or a relationship, it's always on the table. So there's no secrets. And when you have communication and trust, not a lot of people in leadership roles, this is just based on my personal experience, are willing to do that. Yeah. Is sometimes, whether in our personal life or our professional life, things don't happen because we don't get out of our own way, right? Are you willing to humble yourself, get out of your own way to seek the true definition of success in whatever it is that you're in? If you're looking for a successful relationship, are you willing to humble yourself, admit your own faults, so that way the relationship can succeed? Or if you have a business partner or your business or whatever it is, are you willing to humble yourself, look at what is the goal here, and it doesn't matter who's at fault, let's address it going forward to make sure we're all on the working in the same team. We can accomplish what we want to accomplish. I love what you just said. It doesn't matter whose fault it is. Yeah. Sometimes people want to make sure you know it's your fault. And yeah. like, it's like... I think we've all experienced that. Yeah. Too. yeah I mean, we've I'm, all experienced that. Yeah. I'm, I'm, <laughs> I'm an over explainer sometimes on people just to make sure you He's know. He's got about two hands up. up and a foot. And Brian, yeah. Brian, you know, you know you fucked up, right? And you're like, yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm like, but you know. But you, you know, know you, you, you fucked up, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I know because I said that like seven times. But like, you know, like, uh, I was a classic over communicator. Because oh, like man, when you're reprimanding dude. people, sometimes people just sit there and like, and I'm like, they're not giving me anything. So maybe I didn't explain it well enough. And I'm like going around in circles and really <laughs> sure. like they know, okay, now you're crying. Yeah. Now yeah. I know, you know, like, like, it's, yeah. and, like oh, I, gosh. you know, it's, it's really, it's so unfortunate. And I, and I, and I speak from experience, right? I'm, I'm extremely vulnerable. Like I have all, like I, I'll lay it all out. There's the, why I hide it, right? Um, I'm not ashamed for my past. My past is who I am, or is what. Excuse me. What allowed me to be here today? Like I have made those mistakes. I have wanted to wrong somebody and make sure they know they're wrong more than I've wanted to change the situation. Because like I'm like, if they understand they're wrong, it'll change. No, no, no. Like I've realized that it doesn't matter who's wrong. If I take if I take responsibility, I can change it. And the reality is, is that nobody's willing to change. Like you can't expect anybody to change if you're not willing to first change. And you should never change with the expectation that somebody else is gonna change. You should change for your own reasons and that's it. Like there should be no expectations on either way. And I think that's another word that's underused in communication is, is expectations. People put mm. expectations on other yeah. people with no prior commitment from that other person but like, and I've learned this, I learned this a hard way. I learned this through a couple of my past employees. That they're like, Billy, you put so much pressure on me. And I was like, I do? Like, I just want you to win. And they're like, bro, like stop with it. Like, I'm good. But you want me, you, you see more potential in me than I see in myself. And I was like, whoa. And they're like, you know what kind of pressure that puts on a person? And I was like, damn. Like, that's wild. Now that's a little bit of an extreme level, but like yeah. often as an employer, like, I, and it's great that I see the, the, the true potential in you. But, like, I also have to let you be you. And I have to let you live to the potential that you see. Just because I see more in you doesn't mean that, that's, that I have to push that on you. Maybe that's not who you want to be. Maybe you don't want those responsibilities. Yeah. And that's fine because that's it's your life to live. And I think often we put so much responsibility on our employees, particularly our employees. As employers, we expect the world. We, we put our business's success or failure in the hands of our employees. But like you said, we work for them. They don't work for us. Yeah. And I think that goes back to like the expectations come from you. Like if you expect this from your team, then you need to do whatever it takes to put your company in a position to be able to recruit those types of people, pay those types of people, train those types of people, develop a system for those types of people. Like... The results don't come from the individuals. They come from the structure that you build in your businesses. And so at the end of the day, the only expectation is on you and your ability to be able to create what it takes to develop people to be able to achieve the results you want. It's not the people that need the expectations put on them. It's you need to put those expectations on yourself and then put the work in to develop the system to be able to support those types of people. This might sound kind of crazy to some, but... I want to share this based on what you just said about like putting the right system to support to support your people for the best chances for them to succeed. You know what a personal goal I have for my businesses, my different ventures that I do, and the employees that we have and the people that we work with is 
you know what one of the biggest compliments to me would be, honestly, is I know I'm doing something right with the people that I work with and employees if I have helped them achieve the next level to move on to a greater opportunity. If you can help someone, if you can take in an employee, right, who let's just, let's just say as an example is, and I'm just saying, right, is not talented, okay? And you create them or you help them become good at something and because of how you've helped them, you've set them up for success that they got recruited by, by someone else that's gonna pay them more, you know, or it doesn't even have to be paid, just give them a better opportunity. Yes. Maybe they start their own business. That's the biggest compliment. Because that shows you are doing something right, not only as a business owner, but as an individual in setting people up for success and making them succeed. I think it's a huge compliment, right? If you own a company and someone reaches out to you asking about an employee. Yeah. I wouldn't take that personally because what is my intentions here? Do I want to keep that employee working for me or do I want the best for my employee? Preach. What do I want? I want Preach. the best for my employee. And yes. if the best thing for my employee is this person is willing to take them, pay them 1.5 or 2x more, I'm, I will, I'll give you the yeah. intro. Yeah. Like you, I'll give you the yeah. intro what, what to this to person. What can I do to help? You know, and, and it's funny because I used to tell employees that all the time, I, like, especially when they'd get in the management. I'm like, look, look like, like I, want you to, I want you to continue chasing your goals. Like, if there's anything I can ever support you, like, the only thing I ask of you is that you never leave here going down, only go up. Yeah. Like I, you, the only time you'll ever hear from me talk to you about why you're leaving is if you're going down. If you mm -hmm. leave here to go to McDonald's, bro, we got a problem. <laughs> but if you leave here to go to a better opportunity, yeah, uh, pursue better you know, a, a better lifestyle, better wages, percent, dude. more something in alignment with your with what your goals are, go. Like I will write you a letter of recommendation. Do you want me to call them? Yeah. I will just give them my verbal letter of recommendation. Like, and and we we're just talking about this on at Wednesday, on Wednesday. I was talking with. Um, uh, the, the owners of Mango Crazy and we were talking about it about like like people developing. I think they introduced me to their driver and they're like, God, this yeah. guy's going to be a beast, man. Like he's going to go launch his own things. I was like, I love that you're talking about this kid that you're, you, you need in your business right now. But yet you're juiced for his potential and who he's going to become yeah. and you know he's going to go do some cool stuff. And like they're like, they're like bragging about how he's going to eventually open his own business. And that's so awesome when I see entrepreneurs like that because I see other entrepreneurs that will like wrong something like, yeah, man, that, that jackass, man, he fucking left. Why? Bro, he thinks he can make more money somewhere else. I'm like, cool, like, probably can. He probably can, like, yeah. and Like, cool. Like, I don't want, to be perfectly frank, as much as I do want, I, want, I would love my whole team, love all these guys. I would love my whole team to be here till the day we close the business or sell the business. Right, yeah. But the reality is, is I don't want to hire people that are that complacent that if my company is not evolving and aligning with their goals, that they are just like, eh, it's, it's easier to stay here. What's that sound like? That sounds like the fucking comfort zone. Yeah. I want people that are willing to chase their goals. Now, if, they're, if their ability to chase their goals align with them being able to stay here, fuck yeah, do it. Stay here the rest of that's your life. Perfect. That's, that's perfect. That's great, yeah. But if, if at some point the alignment's no longer there, that's fine. Go chase your goals, man. Like, I, I'm, it's, I think it's always so, been so funny when... We've had employees leave and they'll run into me and they're like, like, oh shit. And I'm like, yo, what's up? Dude? Nervous. Like, Go in and they're like, yeah. oh, you're not mad at me? I'm like, why? I would be mad at you. Well, I left. Like, yeah. you didn't leave on bad terms. You didn't like yeah. walk out of a shift. And you went to go chase your dreams. Like, you went to go do something bigger and better. Like, fuck yeah, like high five. Like, 